so um, Brother Transcendence is going to invite three sounds of the bell. And I invite you to sit comfortably and relax and gently bring your attention to your breathing. The sensation that you have is the breath comes in through your nostrils or your mouth, going down through your throat, into your lungs, your belly rising, and the sensation you feel as the breath goes out, as your belly falls, as the air comes up through your, your windpipe, out through your nose, through your mouth, your mouth. And when you notice that thinking is coming up, or some other thing that's pulling you away from the, the attention on your breathing, you just gently guide your attention back to the breath. So can we try that as we listen to three sounds of the bell? Maintain your attention on your breath the whole way, the whole time? No. <laughs> Was there anyone who could? No. I think some, some of you. Maybe some of you have experience already doing this, so you were able to do it. What did you find? That, what happened with your mind? Please speak out. My mind went to... Uh like to be here and then you know, going off on other directions and kind of come circling. Were you able to guide your mind back? Did you did you become aware of that your mind had gone off? Mm -hmm. Yes, twice. Twice. <laughs> Very good. Very practical. Anyone else? Yeah? Um, um, I started thinking about some of the questions I wanted to ask later on, so questions I wanted to ask later on, so... I just tried to um, recognize what I was thinking when I was So she was thinking of some questions that she wanted to ask us, and she just recognized that she was doing that and was able to let it go. Very good. Anyone else? stuff is feel a little bit uncomfortable and so his mind went to the sensation. Yeah. So there are things that can pull us away right from being aware of our breath. Okay, so thinking, it could be a physical sensation in the body, you know, especially being full. Yeah. Were you able to bring your attention back to the breath? Yeah. Good. So this is a kind of training. Yeah. And as we progress and we cultivate that in our daily life, it becomes easier to learn to gently bring the attention wherever we would like to place it. And, and, and mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness is not only about mindfulness, mindfulness of breathing, 
It's just that our breath is always there, and it's something that affects how our body feels. Right? Our breathing affects our circulation, it affects our heart rate, it affects many things. Right? We're dependent on the, the air that we breathe in for every moment of our lives. If we cannot breathe, even for just a few minutes, we will know it <laughs> very quickly, right? It's, it's essential for our, our life yeah, from the moment we're born. So the breath is always there. So it's always there for us to come back to. And that's why we like to teach mindfulness of breathing um, as a first step and something that you can carry with you through your whole life of practice. It's, it'll always be there for you. So that's mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Um, there's mindfulness of sitting. Right? We're all sitting, we're seated here. Right? We can be aware of how we're sitting. For example, I can be aware of my, my butt, my backside on the cushion. I can, I can be aware of the contact it makes with the cushion. <coughs> I'm aware of my knees touching the ground. And I can bring my attention to that, that feeling of contact with the earth that my knee, both of my knees make with the earth. I can be aware, I have my one leg crossed on my thigh. So I can be aware of my foot touching my thigh. All of these things, they're not, they're not painful, they're not particularly pleasant, but they're feelings, right? They're what we call neutral feelings, right? And we have a lot of neutral feelings. Um, oftentimes we're not aware of them because they're not particularly pleasant, they're not particularly painful, so our attention is not drawn to them as, as strongly as it is to the painful and pleasant ones. But today what I'd like you to, to take as your practice is to start to bring more awareness to these kind of neutral sensations. The ones that are just kind of every day. They're with us every moment. Yeah. One of them is the breathing. We, we, the contact the air makes with our nose and our mouth or our, um, our lungs right, you know, our chest rising. It's usually, unless we have some kind of sickness, it's not painful, it's not particularly pleasant, unless we've been holding our breath. <laughs> for a few minutes, right? And it's very pleasant to breathe in. But most of the time, it's just a neutral sensation. So part of uh, mindfulness training involves being aware of these kind of neutral sensations. Uh, or the, the, in, in Buddhist technical terminology, they say, neither pleasant nor painful feelings. <laughs> so it's those kind of feelings that are not particularly pleasant, they're not particularly painful. So whatever doesn't fit into either of those categories, that's the kind of feeling we want to start to bring more awareness to. Um, so why do we want to do that? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Those feelings make up a majority of our sensation. Right, very, very good. That's, that's my experience too. <laughs> Most of the feelings I have are, 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 are in that category. right? And But in fact, our mind is quite tricky and it tends to pay much more attention to the ones that are more extreme, right? That are on the side of being very pleasant or very painful, right? So that's what we remember. And another translation of the term smriti, which is Sanskrit for mindfulness, is also just remembering, right? It means we remember to come back to what's really happening right now. And when we only think about the pleasant or painful sensations, we get a kind of skewed representation of what's really happening. Because we feel like we're not really alive unless we have a very strong pleasant or strong painful sensation. When we cultivate mindfulness, we learn to be alive to these, all of these sensations. Not just the neutral ones, but since they make up the bulk of what we experience, we become much more aware of them. And so we come to understand our body in a deeper way and our mind. So that'll be a, a, one of the practices we'd like to, to have you do. And, and the body scan that you experience in deep relaxation is, is another one of those practices that cultivates mindfulness of these neutral sensations. You're not usually aware of your heart, right? Beating, but it's always there, beating. It's not painful, it's not particularly pleasant, but it's there. It's a sensation. And you become aware of it. You recognize what's happening. Um, so bringing awareness to these neutral sensations, that's a, a training you want to really take away from this day, if we can take one. Um, Brother Transcendence invited the bell. We, in our monastery, we have bells everywhere. <laughs> Not just these kind you see here, but also telephones. When the telephone rings, we, we practice 
listening to it, just stopping what we're doing, uh, being aware, coming back to our breath, being aware of our breathing, being aware of these, how our body is, and we, we follow our breathing for three um, rings of the bell, of the telephone. And so if you call one of our centers, you'll, you might be surprised if you, somebody picks it up before three rings. <laughs> because that's usually all of our friends who know us pretty well, when they call, they never expect us to pick up before three, three tones of the, the, the phone. Because they know that wherever they're calling, whether it's in the office, whether it's in the residence, that whoever is there with the phone is stopping and just coming back to their breath for three rings. And then they will go over and they'll pick up the phone. We have uh, clocks with chimes. And so every 15 minutes, there's a chime that goes off, and it reminds us to come back to our breathing. Um, we, when people don't turn off their cell phones, even when our teacher is there, giving a Dhamma talk to a thousand people, oftentimes he'll stop and just listen and just follow his breathing as the person's cell phone rings and they grow redder in the face when they realize that everybody <laughs> is stopping because their cell phone is ringing. So if you haven't shut off your cell phone, you might like to <laughs> save yourself the embarrassment. But, um, so these are just things that, um, while well, they weren't around in the Buddhist time, except maybe there were, there were bells, but they're around us now and they're ways that we can, um, they're tools we can use to help us cultivate mindfulness. So the, the bell helps us, helps us to do a, a practice, two practices that are fundamental to um, our style of practicing. One is to practice stopping, and the other is to practice looking deeply. So stopping. There are many things that um, we use uh, besides the bell in, in, in our lives to help us stop. Right? We have stop signs right, when we're driving. We have the red light and the traffic light that helps us to stop. Um, maybe you you have um, when you have your. I know the computers are getting faster every year, but sometimes you, you want to do work on your computer and then it's turned off and you have to turn it on, and then you have to wait 30 seconds or a minute for the computer to turn on. So what are we doing in, in these moments, right? Of, are we just waiting? Are we just uh, are we feeding our impatience, our worry? I know I, I, I did that a lot <laughs> um, before I had a practice like this. Um, or are we really stopping and becoming aware of what's happening inside of our body? But what I'd invite you, invite you to do um, is to use these moments to practice stopping and looking deeply. Not, not just waiting around for something outside to happen. Because the red light will turn green eventually. It's not going to go any faster because we're waiting for it. Right? And your computer is not going to boot up any faster because you want it to, right? It's just going to take that amount of time. So instead of just kind of wasting this time, um, cultivate, you know, building up impatience, um, we can stop and come back to our breathing and be aware of what's happening in our body and also set our intention for how we want to use the computer or how we want to drive until the next stop sign. It's a moment to stop and look back at what we're doing. Right? Are we having a conversation that's maybe not so nice? You know? Is there anger coming up? Do we feel um, anxiety? Are we having a lot of thinking, like worry coming up? So this practice of stopping can take us out of whatever that pattern of thinking we're caught in is and come back to ourselves. And I, I suggest that you can start with coming back to your body, coming back to your breathing. Why is that? <laughs> um, well, the mind is very tricky. <laughs> so there is mindfulness of our mind, there's mindfulness of what's going on in our mind, but you know, oftentimes our teacher will say, until we've mastered, or he'll say it more like this, it's, it's, um, it's easier for us to come back to our body and to be really aware of what's going on in our mind until we've mastered what's happening in our body. So the body can be a starting point. Oftentimes people come to Buddhism or mindfulness and they want to know more about their mind right away. So they want to be aware of what kinds of thoughts they're having, what kind of um, desires are coming up. 
I was just um, meeting an old friend here. I, he lived in Philadelphia, and uh, I was sharing with him about my own my own introduction to mindfulness, which came at a time when I was just caught in my thinking, nonstop. I just couldn't get out of this thinking process. I had been uh, living abroad for a few years, and I came back to the States, and I've been in a lot of activism and stuff that watered a lot of seeds of anger in me, trying to change the world outside of me. And I came back, and I was suddenly, after eight years, back in my mom's house, <laughs> living, living, you know, and, and, and when I left, I was still kind of a kid. You know, I just finished high school, and then I spent eight years, four years in college, a number of years living abroad, and suddenly I'm back like a you know little kid again <laughs> in my mom's house, and and I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what to do with my life. I, I wanted to live more simply. I didn't want to have a car and a house and kids and kind of whole catastrophe. <laughs> but I wanted to live simply on, on the planet. It doesn't mean you can you can have a family and kids and live simply. I'm, I'm just saying at that time I really wanted to reduce my impact on the earth. I wanted to not contribute to the, the problems in the world, but find a way to, to, to help people out of it, and help myself out of it. And it seemed like every kind of job I could get, every kind of work, was only going to add to the problem. You know, I had to have, would have to have a car to get to work, and then eventually I have to get a house, you know, and, and so forth. You know, all the things that kind of make up our lifestyle today. And so I, was, I had a kind of period of depression, of trying to figure out how do I get out of this situation. And I also don't want to be, have a job that's um, you know, contributing to taking money from people who, who need to have food, who, who need just basic things when I have the basic things to live off of. And that's when I found this mindfulness practice. And what really helped me come out of this constant worrying about what I'm going to do with my life was just being aware of my body. So that I take my attention away from my thinking, from this, you know, because when we attend to our thinking, it just becomes a circular thing. We can think like we're reasoning, it seems like we're reasoning our life out, but in fact, we're just going around in circles. It's not very reasonable at all. And it's really our emotions, our feelings that drive what we're doing. So when we come back to our body, we're much more aware of, oh, this is actually what's happening with me right now. This is my heart. It's beating faster. It's because I've been worrying. Yeah, I've been caught in this process of thinking, which brings up worry, makes my heart beat faster. So suddenly I was aware of that. You know, this causal chain, right? The thinking, the worry, my heart. And other things like that. And I'd be using the computer, and I would use it for an hour, two hours, non-stop. And my breathing, when I started to be aware of my body, started to become more shallow. I wasn't aware that I was breathing. I wasn't taking the deep breaths I might take if I were just sitting aware of my breathing. So something in the mental process of my work on the computer was affecting my body. So there's a connection between the mind and the body. So this is mindfulness. It's making this connection, right? How is the mind embodied? So, as I started to practice, I saw this instant result. Instantly I was becoming calmer. I was able to be aware of my feelings that were coming up. I had strong, painful feelings. I could see that my thinking was triggering those feelings. And then if I brought my attention to my breathing, or just the position of my body, and suddenly I wasn't feeding. There was no more nutriment from my worry or my anxiety. And I was able, my body became calmer. My heart became calmer. So if we have that experience of um, being aware of our body, we become, we, the mind becomes a much simpler thing to deal with. Yeah? Um, before that I found that my mind was just going in every direction and I couldn't really understand that no matter which direction it went underneath all that thinking was my desire you know, my, or my kind of craving for food or sex or a position or fame 
the thoughts were different. They were like, you know, maybe I want to have this kind of job, maybe I want to have this kind of job, or maybe I want to eat this kind of food, or have that kind of girlfriend, or, you know. The thoughts were different, but underneath it, it was still this common formation, or we call mental formation, of craving, you know, or, or grasping. It's kind of like a, like you have this little hand in your, inside of you, in your mind, and it's reaching out for different objects of desire, objects that are out there. So I became aware of that kind of grasper happening inside, and I was able to, by being aware of my body, notice how it came, it arose, and how I was able to, with, when I no longer fed it with my thinking, it was able to let go, to release. So this letting go is a very important part of the practice. And it's really the, the core of the practice of stopping. That's why we have the bell. And whatever we're doing in that moment, we stop and we let go. And the looking deeply is what mindfulness helps us to do. Right? As we cultivate awareness of our body, we're able to go inside and notice how one thing leads to another how these things are interconnected. Our thinking is connected with the state of our mind. The state of our mind is connected with our sensations in the body. It's connected with how our body feels, the response of our body, our heart rate, our breathing, our circulation. All these things, they're, they're rising from the state of our mind. So when we become, we become aware of that, we suddenly can become master of our body right? and master of our mind. For at least that moment, maybe not forever, <laughs> but at least in that moment, we, we have a clear vision of what's happening, how this this chain of causation is causing our is changing our experience of the present moment, and we're able to let go. Or we, that means we let go of the things that are we're grasping onto, that are are feeding our worry, are feeding our stress, are feeding our desire. I'd just like to finish my sharing by um, looking at um, four kinds of nutriments that we uh, become aware of as we go deeper into mindfulness so that we can understand better how we're feeding the things that we don't like and how we can um, feed, like feed more of those things that we do like, like mindfulness, understanding, compassion. So the first kind of nutriment we call edible food. Um, it's just food, <laughs> right? It's what sustains our body, yeah? Like a bagel, <laughs> um, you know, couscous, whatever, rice, uh, even what we drink, yeah? Everything that we ingest in our body. Um, we become aware of how the food impacts our body. Right? And this is part of the practice of eating meditation, which we'll do later on. Um, we can become aware of how we chew the food, right? How we how it goes into our body, how we digest it. As we go deeper into mindfulness practice, we can even become aware of how we're breaking down the food in our body and how it actually feels. You know, you, I can. I've been a vegetarian, you know, maybe more than ten years, so I can feel even when I eat a little bit of dairy, I can feel the difference in my body when I eat that. I know that I've eaten dairy because I can feel how it breaks down in my stomach and how it feels in my body. Um, I don't know, for me I get a little bit sweaty and it feels a little bit greasy, it's, but it's just, it may be different for you. The point is that we become aware of how we ingest the food and what effect it has on our body. This can be extended into many directions, right? And things that have to do with ecology, about where our food comes from, right? Because the quality of the food and the way the food is produced affects also our consciousness, affects our mind and our body. And <coughs> mindfulness can bring, bring awareness to that. So mindfulness is not just mindful of what's happening in our body, but it's also aware of what's happening in the world around us. I was just reading that there's something like a 54 to 1 ratio between, say, the input you need for uh, a, a meat or animal protein diet compared to the protein that is, you can get from vegetable sources. Right? So when we look and we see that our body is not separate from the world, 
we can see that there's an imbalance here, right? Maybe there's something a little bit out of whack, and that may affect us in the way that we eat. It may, it may not, but that's that's an awareness that, that you, you may have. Another nutriment that we, we have is called contact. Right? These are interconnected, right? The food makes contact with our body as we ingest it. We, we, we eat it, it goes in. Uh, the Buddha gave an example of a cow who has a kind of skin disease, who goes up against a, a rotted piece of wood, and there are little insects that penetrate right into its flesh and, and suck its blood. <laughs> he was trying to give a visual example of how our, our contact with things, you know, our contact through, the, through our senses, through our eyes, our ear, our nose, tongue, our mouth, our body, and our mind, affects the way that we experience the world and how we grow into the future, how we change. Um, so we can become aware of what, what kinds of things we're coming into contact. Are we spending many hours watching television? What kind of images are we coming into contact with? We can be aware of the conversations we're having with those around us. How do we? How does that affect our thinking? This is all part of the practice of being mindful of the things that are nurturing or, or giving us nutriment in our life. The third uh, nutriment is becoming aware of our volition. This is an image I really like. It's, the Buddha said it's like we have a, two strong men who are grabbing another man and they're, they're pulling him into a pit of coals, hot coals, to, they want to throw him in there. And, and the man who wants to be free, right? He wants to be, he doesn't want to be pulled into that pit of hot coals. This is like our habit energy, right? Our habits. When we set our mind to something, it can be a very, very powerful thing. It can affect the whole trajectory of our lives. But it can also just affect what we do in the next moment. Um, and that can be something very, very good, too. We can have a wholesome volition. Right? We can set our mind to, to, doing, to helping other people. We can set our mind to transforming our suffering. Yeah. But we can also set our mind to making a lot of money, <laughs> to having a beautiful house, to having a beautiful wife. So volition is a source of nutriment, what we set our mind to. And the, the last... Um, nutriment that I'll leave you with is um, consciousness. Um, we've got millions of images running through our mind every moment. Images from television, from advertising, from um, our memories, from films, from books, conversations. Um, we have you know, smells, right? So the contact leaves this whole memory of smells. Do you ever have that sensation of suddenly smelling something and it bringing you back to somewhere 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Yeah. So our consciousness is another kind of nutriment. Yeah. All those things, it's kind of like we have this whole buffet table that's spinning through our mind at a thousand miles an hour every moment. And wherever our mindfulness sets, that becomes our future. So the Buddha actually described this consciousness nutriment like a man, who, a thief who the king orders to be stabbed by spears from morning till evening by hundreds of spears through his body. Sometimes it's like that in our consciousness. We're, we're, we're just inundated with a smorgasbord of images, thoughts, things that are pulling us away from just being aware of what's happening with us right now. And that doesn't mean that some of that can be good, can bring us in a good direction. But the choice is ours, right? Where do we put our attention? What part of our consciousness? In our individual consciousness, or our collective consciousness? Where are we putting our attention? So those are four things I'll leave you with as um, in, in your mindfulness of uh, how you're putting your attention. Because what we're, we're going to bring your attention to throughout this day is really where you're, what you're putting your attention on so that you can better make, make better choices in your lives as to what you're doing, what your future will be like, right? which is really just this present moment. <laughs> um, and, and knowing what's, what, what kinds of nutrients you're feeding yourself with is very, very helpful in determining your experience here. So thank you for listening. <laughs>